Okay. Thank you, everyone, for joining ACRL's Distance Learning Section Discussion Group today. We'll be joined by a panel of distance librarians who will attempt to define distance in the context of the academic library. I'm Jill Hallam Miller, Discussion Group Chair, and I'd like to make a few acknowledgments before we get started. First, I'd like to thank ACRL and Allison Payne and E. Lois Sharp for getting us set up with the technology. Thanks to the Distance Learning Section Executive Committee for their support in bringing you this presentation. And special thanks to DLS Chair Alice Dockerby for her support of our virtual presentation initiative. I'd also like to, to thank this year's Outstanding Discussion Group Committee for their hard work and dedication to making this panel discussion happen. The committee will be working behind the scenes today to make sure our discussion runs smoothly. Our panelists today have each prepared a brief presentation on a particular topic related to distance in the library. Between each presentation, we'll ask the panel a few questions and we'll try to include any audience uh, questions as well. Kristen Heathcock, one of our members, uh, one of our committee members, will be watching for your questions as well as for any technical issues. If you do find that you're having technical issues, you can contact WebEx Tech Support at 877-469-3239. Also, our committee member, Lindsay Wharton, will be tweeting about our session today. So if you're looking for us on Twitter or you want to join in the conversation on Twitter, you'll want to use DLS Define Distance Chat. Hashtag DLS Define Distance Chat. The entire committee has been involved in bringing this panel discussion about, and the team is already working on a few more exciting presentations for the 2014-2015 year, so please stay tuned for more information in the coming months. And finally, I would like to thank our panelists for being here today and for sharing their expert knowledge with us. We're very fortunate to have with us today Neely Tang, who is currently the off-site public services librarian at the Management Library of the Samuel Curtis Johnson Graduate School of Management at Cornell University, where she provides research support and instruction for MBA students both on and off campus. She's also the liaison for off-site programs at Johnson, the School of Hotel Administration, and the School of Industrial and Labor Relations, as well as being the business liaison for Cornell Tech in New York City. Neely is currently located in Philadelphia, PA, which is four and a half hours from Cornell, adding another dimension to the term off-site. She can be found on a computer screen in the library most days for desk hours, and no one recognizes her without her headset. Luann Edwards currently holds the position of e-librarian at Tiffin University. In this role, she wears many hats. As a member of the School of Graduate and Distance Education, Luann works closely with instructional designers and faculty subject matter experts in order to integrate library resources and services into online courses. In this capacity, her work also revolves around copyright and accessibility compliance. In addition, she serves roughly two-thirds of the total student population as a remote reference librarian, providing a variety of synchronous and asynchronous services and resources to support Tiffin's online programs in the United States and abroad. She also serves on various university committees, working closely with online and seated faculty to address topics such as plagiarism intervention, outcomes assessment, and information literacy. She has presented on the topics of copyright compliance, library assessment, library website design, and distance librarianship. librarianship. She holds an MLIS from Kent State University and an MA in English from National University. Seth Allen is the online instruction librarian at King University Library. He has an MLIS from University of North Carolina at Greensboro and is presently working on an MA in New Media and Global Education at Appalachian State University. Seth is an avid believer in free and cheap technology to take library, library services online. Seth drinks too much coffee and loves Thai food. He travels to cities and explores art museums as much as possible. Priscilla Coulter is a science librarian at American Public University System. From her home office in eastern Texas, 
She helps students all over the globe navigate academic research in an all online environment. Her recent focus has been partnering with faculty to integrate scaffolded information literacy instruction into classroom assignments. And last but definitely not least, Stephanie Buck is an in assistant professor at Oregon State University Libraries in the Teaching and Engagement Department. She has worked closely with OSU's eCampus programs to improve remote access to library resources for distance education students and faculty. Professor Buck earned her bachelor's degree in history from Iowa State University in 1988. She earned a master's in history and a master's of library and information sciences from the University of Hawaii, Manoa in 1993. In 2010, she completed her Master of Education with an emphasis in instructional design at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. She worked at Western Washington University in Bellingham, Washington as the distance education librarian and at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation as a public access computer trainer before coming to OSU. Panelists, at this point in the program, even though you can't hear them, the participants are giving you a round of enthusiastic applause. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to pass the ball to Neely Tang right now. And Neely, why don't you talk to us a little bit about your ideas about what a distance librarian is. Great. Thanks so much, Jill. OK. Hi, everyone. I know lunch hours are precious, so thanks so much for joining us in this discussion. Um, I was asked to start off our panel discussion today by talking a little bit about what does distance mean these days and what specifically what it means to me. So what is it exactly that distinguishes us from just being a librarian? I'll say up front, I don't have answers really, just a whole lot of questions. Do we only serve students in an online program? What about blended programs? Would we only work with students when they are virtual in that situation? Or is it the fact that the students are not physically in the presence of a librarian, and that's what makes us distance librarians? If this is the case, then how far away do the students need to be? Halfway across the world, 12 time zones away? How is serving that patron really any different than working with someone in a different state? Or a student chatting from a dorm room across campus? or even a student emailing a question from the stacks when the research desk is on a different floor. Or maybe it's all about where the librarian is located. This is definitely true in my situation. Not only do I serve students who are not on campus, but I also happen to be located off campus a state away while serving students, faculty, and staff who are physically on campus. So I've essentially become a floating head on a screen. I sit at the desk during my scheduled hours by remoting into a computer at the management library in Sage Hall and invite myself to a WebEx video conferencing session that I have started for my office in Philadelphia. When patrons come by with a question, the student at the circulation desk takes them to my computer and we conduct a reference transaction. Just like when I used to sit um, next to the student in person, I guide them through developing a research strategy and go over how to use various resources to get to the information they need. I have been remoting into work for the past two and a half years, and the feedback from our patrons has been very positive. MBAs who work with me for the first time often comment how cool it is the library is offering this service and ask if they can reach me this way from their apartment or even Sage Atrium, which is down the hall from the library. WebEx just released their newest um, meeting room option, so this is a service that I hope to be offering our patrons in the near future. I'm not quite um, like Siri or Amazon Kindle's Mayday button, but one of these days, you might just be able to find me at the touch of a finger on your mobile device and ready to assist you with your research question wherever you might be. So thank you so much for listening and sharing these couple of minutes with me. Um, I would love to hear your ideas about being a distance librarian and where remote service might go next and any other situations that might benefit from this virtual service. So thank you. Thanks, Neely. I was also thinking while you were talking um, about how cool it is 
that you are not so much that you're a floating head, but that um, that you can you know manage the service this way. That's that's great. Um, you mentioned using WebEx in serving students and in communicating with colleagues, and you've mentioned that that's been very successful. What other technologies have you found to be beneficial for serving students at a distance, and are there any technologies that you've found to be particularly unhelpful? That's a really good question, Jill. <laughs> um, so I would have to say the single best investment ever is a good pair of headphones with a microphone. Um, it makes such a difference in communicating um, audio. Um, you can hear very clearly, and people can hear you, and there's no feedback. Other than that, anything that works for my patrons. Basically, I'm pretty much game for trying just about anything that a student asks me to try. So I would say that Google Hangout is great if you have a Gmail account. Um, Skype has come a long way as well. And quite frankly, having a phone number as a backup is always useful. Um, you know, not the latest and greatest in technology, but super handy. Um, I have to say I also really love BombGar, which is a remoting software that a lot of IT departments use. And when I first started this work, I had no idea that it existed. Um, but it allows me to meet students at computer terminals in the library where our specialty databases are located. So like the Wharton Research Data Services or DataStream, where they're just located physically inside the library. Um, this, is, this allows me to meet them at the terminal and to um, assist them with any questions that they have. As far as... Um, things that are unhelpful. Um, I think staying flexible and creative about the tech is important, and it seems like there's a place or situation for just about any software or platform, but I have to say I'm really not crazy about Adobe Connect, and I see that a couple people are asking questions. So to answer you, I'm, um, I had a question about what mic am I using? Um, Molly, I am using um, a Logitech. It's a basic headset and a microphone. As long as it works well with whatever system you have compatible, I found that's what's really what's most important. And um, Pat has asked how critical is having a camera for me. Um, in my work, because I'm working with on-campus students who are physically there, uh, the camera actually plays a really big role in my day-to-day. So along those lines, uh, people can see me in video conferencing, and I make sure that the lighting is good, that um, I look presentable. You'll never find me in my pajamas. <laughs> and um, I also make sure that, you know, I look directly into the camera, which takes some practice in getting used to because you feel odd staring into this um, dark void. But that gives the person on the other end of the session a sense that um, you're really focused on them and looking them in the eye. So I found that's really helpful. Great. Thank you so much, Neely. And I think um, we will all agree that your, your mic sounds great. So um, we have a comment that... Uh, that the mic should be, or the headset should be USB for decent sound, and I've also heard that to be true. Um, and then we had a comment about Big Blue Button and that it works much better than Adobe Connect. Um, okay, so uh, next I would like to hear from Stephanie Buck. Uh, Stephanie, I'm going to pass the ball to you, and if you could uh, share with us what, it, what you think distance students are. Great, thank you. Can you all hear me? We can. Great, all right, just double checking. Technology um, is, teaching with technology is a lot like doing a wild animal act. You never know when it's gonna pee on stage. I did not make that up, but I think it's a very apt um, phrase, and you're welcome to borrow that if you want. Um, thank you all for joining, me for, uh, joining us for this discussion today. Um, I'm Stephanie Buck, and I'm at Oregon State University, and like Neely, I don't know that I have any great answers. I do have a lot of questions. My job, like many of yours, is to assist those students enrolled in our extended education programs in getting access and using the many resources and services that the library provides to them. My topic today is defining the distance learner. And it's something I think about frequently as I work with students. And you'll notice I said my job was to help those enrolled in our eCampus programs, not necessarily those who are at a distance, although those can be synonymous. 
Um, while my students are enrolled in eCampus courses are often not in town, I really don't have any no way of knowing where they are unless I ask them. And as I'm sure is the case for many of you, eCampus is defined as online learning, not necessarily distance learning. We often use these terms interchangeably, but I would argue that, in fact, they are two different things. In the past, our definition of who is a distance learner was based on proximity to campus. And as librarians, we developed services to meet the needs of these students. Sometimes we had to set up some somewhat artificial designations about what constitutes distance, more for economic reasons, given the costs of shipping and mailing, than that we felt those students who were inside the magic 30-mile radius didn't actually deserve book, online, uh, didn't deserve book delivery. Now, of course, we're dealing with a lot of different things. We have online, we have distance, we have hybrid, we have blended, we have e-learning, synchronous, asynchronous, and many other subtle but very significant variations for how students can learn without being physically in a classroom. And you'll notice I said classroom and not on campus because we do have students who are on campus who are taking online courses. Of course, with the increase in electronic access to resources, using the term distance learner for those enrolled in our online programs is misleading, but it's often imposed upon us by our institution. So in my case, for example, eCampus encompasses both the distance and the online learner. By definition, we talk about who gets these services. Um, by definition, distance education programs are those where the instructor and the student are separated. And yes, when it comes to this kind of label of classification, it is the type of coursework an individual is doing often, for example, the number of credit hours being taken online, and less the physical location of the student that matters. But you'll also notice that, I've just taken these from some websites, that we as libraries often have some of these what I would call artificial barriers in place in terms of what it means to be a distance learner. I'll take, give you a moment to take a look at those. So here we have a definition, though, from a program uh, from a particular institution that says that education, um, distance education that uses one or more technologies to deliver to instruction to students who are separated from the instructor and the support regular and substantive interaction between the students and the instructor synchronously or asynchronously. So the separation is still a pretty key point in terms of our understanding of what distance is. And of course, our ACRL standards for distance learning services also note that we are dealing with people who are away from or in the absence of a traditional academic campus. Now, the National Center for Education Statistics provides us with some useful data about how many students are actually doing their work online. The data indicates that while the number of students who are taking their courses fully online is still a fairly small number, at least at public institutions, there is no doubt that this number is growing. Unfortunately, this information doesn't tell us exactly where they are. And that's one of the things that I discovered as I was preparing for this. It's very difficult for us to know exactly how many of the students are truly distant and how many of them are simply enrolled online. What's also interesting is this number here. This is the number of students who are taking some of their courses online or taking hybrid courses or who may be on campus but fully online. Many students take a combination of online and face-to-face. -face. In the fall of 2010, that amounted to about 6 million students who have taken at least one online course, a number that has increased fairly steadily over the last 10 years, anywhere from 9 to 36 percent. Unfortunately, it's very difficult for us to track this trend as students tend to move fluidly between the online and the face-to-face, -face, and their location is often secondary or an unknown factor. This fluidity can make it very difficult for us to serve our students well. If we think about what distance student means to library, that learner is someone who requires some additional services or another type of service that is equivalent, which of course is the basis for our ACRL standards, and we want to provide equivalent services to students who are at a distance. So things that we may not do for a local student. So that kind of brings us to the questions at hand, for which, again, I say I'm not sure I have any answers. Is the student taking all online courses but lives in town and is currently sitting in the library chatting with you about a research project, a distance learner? Maybe not. Is a student who takes all his or her classes online lives in town but never comes to campus a distance learner? Well, maybe. If the student is homebound, well, then that might be a different story. If a student who lives 90 miles away and drives to campus to take one face-to-face -face class once a week, a distance learner? Well, not by many of the definitions that I showed you earlier, because most of those definitions had some sort of, you must be online and outside of a particular mile radius. 
But I think we could really make that argument. While we grapple with these issues, I want to emphasize that it's important for us to recognize that distance does matter. Users who are not physically on campus and more specifically in the library do face certain challenges. Delivery times of physical items being a significant one, but there are many other things, such as questions about utilizing local resources more effectively. There are issues of isolation, questions about not knowing where to go, go for help. And these are really daily challenges for our truly distance learners. So I want to emphasize that as we think about these things, that online does not equal distance, and we have to be cognizant of that. And I'm concerned sometimes as we make these definitions that we're not clear about those things. So I realize this sounds a little contradictory, um, but I do believe that it is our job as distance librarians to break down those if-then barriers as much as possible, even as we recognize that distance and online are not synonymous. How, well, I think more granularity in how we identify our students so that we can best, pro that we can prov provide the best services. This means having a lot more detailed insight about who our learners are and where they are. But on the other side, at the same time, I think we need less artificiality and more reality in how we define distance. That emer imaginary 30 mile ra radius, I would argue, is obsolete. And I'm very happy to open up to any questions and I thank you for your attention. Thanks, Stephanie. While we're waiting for any audience questions to come in, I'll start with one. Um, I've noticed between your presentation and Neely's that definitions of distance are kind of all over the board. And I think this creates some difficulties for the profession. On the one hand, there are actually still libraries that aren't really providing any distance services to students. And on the other, there are libraries that are taking a proactive approach by employing someone to deal with distance students, but the person placed in that position may actually find him or herself having to figure out what the position actually is. How do you think we can start to overcome these kinds of obstacles? Well, I think you're absolutely right that the definition, uh, the definitions are all, all over the place, and I've seen some research done by some colleagues at the AECT about how difficult it is to actually pinpoint what we mean by distance learners, since we do tend to sort of throw them into a pool together with online and hybrid and asynchronous and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, I think that's a good starting point is for us as a profession to come to some, some general agreement about what we think a distance person is. Um, and I think we need to be very flexible and very open about that. I think a person who gets thrown into the position of having that sort of assigned to them and saying, hey, you're going to work with the distance learners. The, the, the most useful thing I think I've done in that regard is a project that I'm working on where I actually did um, quarter-long interviews with distance education students, students, for the most part, who were truly at a distance. Like one of my students was in China, so that was really interesting to find out really what their challenges are. And it's a very um, enlightening, uh, time-consuming, but a very enlightening way to say, you know what, there are some significant challenges for students who physically are not on campus, and we need to recognize those. Okay. I see that it looks like maybe we have either a question or a comment. Let's see. Okay, so Roberta says she's on a secondary campus, not the main campus, so she regularly asks distant from what. Um, okay, so yeah, just that, that idea that, um, that the definitions are kind of all over the place and, and it would be nice if we had some kind of standardization there. Um, another question that I'd like to open up to the entire panel, um, with so much uncertainty about what distance really is. How can we be sure that we're meeting the requirements of the standards for distance learning that Stephanie mentioned? Is there anybody that would like to, to jump on that question? <laughs> Well, I think, this is Stephanie, um, I think it's really important, again, that we engage in the research. And that, of course, is, is challenging with our definitions being sort of all over the place. Um, 
but there's a lot out there for us to still learn and understand about our distance learners um, and a lot of assessment that we can still do. I think if we work, we could work more closely with other people who are also serving the same kind of populations. So I think that we have to um, really take a close look at those things and, and make sure that we keep on top of what is it that our students need. And that is, that is a very challenging thing. Um, and I don't know that I have a great response for, you know, how do we do that? Because getting distance education students to fill out those feedback forms is, you know, it, it's really difficult. So some sort of engaging research project where you have maybe um, focus groups or interviews or something like that. Um, can be a very useful useful thing to do, and something that we could do as more as a as a profession. I this is Neely. I agree with Stephanie. I think there's opportunities here to do ethnographic type research in our particular space to really understand um, how do students define themselves, um, how are we defining them in regards to distance. Does how, and how does that really affect um, how we deliver our services and our resources to the students? And, and if I may, I would also say that when I think one of the things we, we need to do, and I know I need to do, is argue for, at the university level, for some more granularity about how we're defining them. One of the issues that I run into, and some of you probably do too, is that we have, for example, students in our counseling program who are in the PhD and they're enrolled in eCampus, so they're distance students and they get all the services like mailing the books and, and those kinds of things. But then when they take their thesis credits, they're enrolled on campus, which makes no freaking sense, but that's the way it is. And then all of a sudden all their services go away because we take our cue from how they are coded by the registrar which isn't necessarily reality, and it's a pain in the butt, and it's hard for the students, and it's hard for us. So it's a big task, but it's something that maybe, you know, we need to be more vocal about. Okay, excellent points. Um, we do have some questions coming in, and a couple of them I'd like to, um, I'd like to hold until later on in the presentation. I do think we may get answers to some of those questions at a later point in the discussion. Um, but I did want to ask if anyone on the panel is working with study abroad students. So, hi, this is Neely. Um, I do work with um, study abroad students who on occasion uh, find themselves, uh, I primarily work with MBA students, and they do um, take a semester abroad, and they do know that they can continue to using the management library as a resource. Um, in addition to that, we also have a new MBA uh, program starting with um, Tsinghua University in uh, Beijing, China, and um, I am a liaison to that program as well. It will be starting this May. So. Um, I don't know if you have a specific question about what it's like to work with the study abroad students, but I do find that um, depending on the time zone and depending on what the students' needs are, um, email and um, video conferencing have actually been really useful in, in trying to meet their needs beyond uh, trying to solve tech problems with firewall issues in China. This is Priscilla. Uh, we at American Public University System, we deal with a lot of military students, many of whom are deployed. This is not exactly study abroad, but they'll often be in Afghanistan, Iraq, anywhere in the world, um, facing a lot of technological and just day-to-day -day challenges that you have to factor in. Great. Thank you. Um, and Priscilla, I, I think uh, if Stephanie could pass the uh, control over to you. Let's hear from you about the different needs of distance versus face-to-face -face students. Sure, thank you. Um, of course, many of the challenges that all college students face when they're learning about an academic library, uh, they're, they're going to be common to any student taking classes, whether it's in a bricks and mortar university or an online university. Um, and when I'm talking about online, I really do mean completely online. I'm talking truly distant. And um, those students who really don't have access to a bricks and mortar library or classroom at all. Um, so, so very much out there on their own. 
In the years that I've been sitting at a virtual reference desk at an all online institution, I've come to the conclusion that the online learning environment, the truly distant environment, magnifies some of these really typical challenges that all students face. So when I tell people that my online job really is a lot like my face-to-face -face job, the one I had before, in practice, it's actually pretty different. And those differences are really down to just a handful of characteristics of online students that require special handling, if you will, on the librarian's part. Um, the most obvious, of course, is limited time. Um, this is one of the big reasons that a lot of the students are taking online courses in the first place. They're squeezing school into the gaps that are left by full-time jobs and family in a lot of cases. So while librarians think a lot about being where students are, for online students, you really need to think about when they are. So you may have to add reference coverage in the evenings and on weekends outside of those regular hours. And you can really target your staffing by keeping very careful reference statistics, taking a close look at your website analytics, um, and so that you can make sure you have coverage during those peak traffic times. Now, of course, we have sleep sometimes, and not all libraries have the means to provide 24-7 live reference. But if you keep a very comprehensive um, set of frequently asked questions or tutorials on your website to cover those really common questions, make those easy to find, very easy to find, that's crucial. But then your students can find help even during the wee hours when you're offline. Now, when you do have a student at a virtual reference desk, and I'm sure the others would agree with me, you will often find that the reference interview as you learned it in library school is all but useless. I've always wanted to track this more scientifically, but I'm sure that the vast majority of the time, I don't hear from a student at all after I answer their initial email. You can't count on that back and forth questioning that you do when you have a student right in front of you to find out what they tried, what worked for them, what didn't. You have to anticipate what you think they're going to need based on whatever information they give you in their email and what you know about the assignments that are going on in the classes that um, are at your institution. So you encourage them to get back to you if you have more questions and you hope for the best. Um, even when you do have someone on the phone or in live chat or during a live screen sharing session, you can do some back and forth, but sometimes you don't have, in fact, frequently on the phone or, or um, by a chat, you don't have the ability to share your screen and show them in real time. And in fact, you're going to find that often your students will be calling you, again, because of when they are. They're calling you from their evening commute or while they're cooking dinner with their very loud children in the background. They may not have the computer right in front of them. They may not even have something to write with. So even when you have a student in a live interaction, it's crucial to take notes and then send them a very detailed follow-up email outlining what you went over so they have that for later. Online learners also are tired of reading. Uh, most online courses are asynchronous. Um, naturally, they depend really heavily on text-based readings and discussions. Once you add to that the articles and books that they are waiting through for their research paper, if you send them a three-page email <laughs> explaining how to do their research, you're going to cause their eyes to glaze over permanently. So this, of course, is where that technology comes in that, that Neely talked about early, early. If you can add a visual element wherever you can, you're really going to help keep these students' attention. Use short videos or Prezi or um, little Snagit videos um, in your tutorials or your FAQs when you can. It's really easy to use programs like Snagit and Snagit is free um, to add screenshots to illustrate your emails or your FAQs. Use live like screen sharing, of course, if you can. And that's always going to be awesome. It's the closest thing that you can get to the ideal reference experience. But when you are using emails or chat, and, and a lot of, of virtual reference is asynchronous um, or text-based, you really have to resist the urge to lecture, to type out long explanations of things like peer review or Boolean operators when all the student asked for was help writing an article. I know we all want to seize each teachable moment, but often with these very text weary online students, you will accomplish more if you keep your instruction in bite-sized pieces instead. You can always link them to more detailed explanations in those FAQs that you created that we talked about earlier. So keep web writing basics in mind too when you're doing email or writing tutorials. Um, number your steps in your instructions. Use bulleted lists. Break up long paragraphs into shorter ones. Use boldface to make the important points stand out. Now, 
<laughs> these students are also attracted to online courses because they can take them from anywhere. But this means that, you know, like the students in Afghanistan or um, in tiny rural towns in Texas, like me, they, they may be in a situation where their access to internet or technology is, is limited or certainly not optimal. Um, you may have students that have a satellite connection only. You may have students who are using a mobile device much of the time and so don't have an optimal screen display. You may have students who um, have data limits so that they can't watch videos. Um, at least not every video that you offer them, especially when, when combined with the ones that they're required to watch in their classroom. So it's really important that you make sure that every video you have um, has a transcript or at least a web-based version of the same content linked somewhere nearby where it's easy to find so that they can still benefit from that content. Um, use mobile-friendly design wherever you can for those who are using um, their iPads or their phones. Um, if screen sharing like WebEx or Adobe Connect is too data intensive for your users, offer phone service. Use live chat because you're not quite as greedy in terms of data. And then again, since many of them may not be able to see all of your cool visual elements, um, be sure to keep any text-based communication as concise and to the point and clear as possible. It's just one of the paradoxes of online education that a lot of your students won't be able to take advantage of your coolest, most engaging uh, teaching methods. And so the last thing that I want to talk about um, that sort of impacts the practice and, and, and brings special needs <laughs> to our online learners is that feeling of isolation. Um, of course, we know that the students often feel isolated from their classmates and their faculty, and they often they actually are quite remote from their, their classmates and from you. Um, particularly when a deadline is breathing down their necks, you'll find that this, this solo feeling can make them anxious, it can make them frustrated, it can make them irate. Now, I, I know that you see this in, in traditional libraries too, um, but if you advertise your availability, you'll know they, they will know when they can ask for help, where they can ask for help, and, and maybe we'll do so before they reach that breaking point. Um, now, a 48-hour turnaround is sort of typical for an online class. Um, the faculty are responsive, but that can seem like a lot of time for a panic student. So they really do love a quick response, and it's easy enough for us to give it to them. Be understanding and responsive. And again, I know this applies to traditional library experiences too. Um, but I really do believe that when you have a student right in front of you, face to face, they will make more of an effort to be reasonably polite. Online, there is this anonymity, which you see in social media, where people say things that they would never say in a real conversation face to face. Um, I have seen in my inbox everything from terror to snark to frothing rage. Um, but I have only ever seen one student who couldn't be talked off the cliff by some pretty persistent patience and enthusiasm from their library. And so be positive and be understanding. It goes a long way to kind of helping them feel more engaged and connected to you. And then, of course, be proactive. Again, it's a familiar theme to all librarians, no matter how you're working. But um, sadly, a lot of your online faculty, especially the adjuncts, are going to be just as sort of lost in the library as their students are. They don't have time to really stay up to date with what you have available. So they can be a source of a pretty dangerous misinformation if you don't stay in frequent touch with them. Get into the classroom however you can. A link to the library or your email address in the syllabus at the very least. But if you can form and maintain a strong working relationship with your faculty, it'll help them trickle down correct information to their students. It'll let you stay aware of those research assignments so you can anticipate student needs. Um, it will let you know where students are assembling when they're in the library and then how you can intervene to make them more successful. Are there any questions? If we're getting any questions in uh, while we're waiting, I'll, I'll just let you know that, uh, that Priscilla, we had some comments here about people who are using um, Cam Camtasia, Jing, mm -hmm. Snagit, and they're using those, you know, to record one to three minute answers so that they can kind of back up what they're what they're talking about. So those were um, those were great great I ideas that you mentioned. That's a great tactic because keeping those videos very short makes sure that even those with the data limits, even those with the 
the time constraints can, can at least get in there and watch a little bit of it. So that's a great idea. And then there's also the comment um, about ADA compliance. Mm -hmm. So um, they have to have captions, but individuals who don't need it still need captions. So, and, and, uh, and I think Molly says you can add captions to Camtasia videos. And I think e even uploading a video to YouTube, you can, you can kind of add a transcript. Yes, you sure can. But it really is so important to be nimble with the technology and, and not afraid to get in there and play with it. Um, you can learn how to do all those things. I didn't really touch on the ADA part, but um, I found that often some of the, the challenges that are internet limited um, and very, very remote um, overseas students face are a lot like the ones that the, the disabled students face. Great, really um, very interesting, and I think you've given us some, some really wonderful tips, Priscilla, thank you, uh, for dealing with both online or distant students and faculty as well. Mm -hmm. um, Priscilla, if you could hand control over to Luann, we're going to hear from her now. Uh, she's going to share her thoughts on how distance librarians can collaborate with library colleagues. Oh. Hi, everyone. Okay, um, <clears throat> so I know at this point, a lot of our discussion has revolved around, you know, what is a, a distance learner and, and how do we define that? And from my perspective, I really don't think that there is <clears throat> one standard definition for what a distance librarian should do as required by the laws in library land. Um, in my particular situation, the university has actually defined for us what a distance learner is. When students come into Tiffin University, they can come in either as a seated student um, on campus or they can come in as an online student. And they don't usually cross over into the other platform. Um, we do use our learning management platform to supplement some of the seated courses. Um, but an online learner for us is pretty much a person who is in that program online from start to finish. Um, they may be located in Tiffin, um, and they may occasionally go to the seated library, but for the most part, they are still considered distance learning students if they're in an online class. Uh, as far as what I do at Tiffin, um, I am the e-librarian, which um, involves many different aspects. Um, I do handle copyright, particularly in our learning management platform, which is Moodle. Um, anytime that there are accessibility issues, ADA issues with the online students, I handle those as well. And then I work with online student support and online faculty support. Um, so I have a foot kind of in both worlds. I have a foot in the library world, and then I have a foot in the sort of the instructional design world um, in the sense that most of my work revolves around working with the instructional designers and in course development. So in supporting students and faculty, um, we have a variety of methods. We use the standard asynchronous tutorials. Um, usually when a student sends me an email and asks for assistance, I try to do a Jing video, here's how I found what you need, um, link to the search results in our discovery service, here's where you can go to see exactly what I'm looking at, um, and then I also try to provide something in print along with that so that they get a variety of ways to get to the same answer. Um, I also provide reference assistance via email. We use Gmail, so we use Google Hangouts. Um, I've used the chat interface. Um, I've used phone call, and I've also used text messaging. Um, the students that we serve are coast to coast, and then we also have several that are abroad. Um, my, the, last, the last student overseas that I worked with was actually from Bucharest. So we have a lot of diversity going on, and it's nearly impossible to hit those folks at the perfect time of day um, for anything uh, synchronous at all, but sometimes they absolutely need assistance. So it's, you know, 
seven, eight o'clock in the evening sitting at a kid's soccer game texting with a student really quick through the through the Google voice number um, to get them the information they need. It's sort of a situation where the online library services, they don't usually close unless my eyes are closed because those students do depend on assistance relatively quickly. Um, we've also been working on the delivery of some live webinars. Some of our faculty have requested those. And um, the students come in and they can attend the synchronous version, but then there's a follow-up recording link that's distributed back to the instructor to be sent back to the students. So if they're not physically able to be present, um, they can still get the content of that information. But as I mentioned before, a lot of my work actually stems with the instructional design team. And I work in the curriculum and learning systems area um, through the School of Graduate and Distance Education. So I don't report to the library director. I work directly with them on various things. Um, this allows me to be embedded in the course development process in a way that I think is really exciting because when the instructional designers are developing that relationship with a faculty member, and it really is a relationship um, that they develop with the folks they're working with, um, we can actually um, be a part of that and talk to them about how they can integrate library materials into their courses in a way that doesn't violate our licensing agreement, which is interesting because I think a lot of folks just want to pull a PDF out and just stick it in the class, and that might not be a good thing. So it gives us an opportunity to work closely with a faculty member and sort of build a relationship of our own that we might not ordinarily have um, I put on the slide that I am the treasure hunter extraordinaire because if there is some obscure resource that someone can't find, um, usually it's, hey, let's send, let's send Lou Anne an email and, and see if she can find it. Um, that happens a lot in the design process or in the course revision process, especially when there's a material where the link has gone dead or there's this mystery PDF in a class and they're not quite sure how it got there. Um, that's the kind of stuff that I look for. The development of um, supplemental materials and libguides. I worked very closely with our seated librarians to develop content um, for everyone. Um, you know, MLA style and APA style and things like that, they don't change whether you're seated or online. The difference between our online experience and the seated experience really has to do with the availability of print materials because Tiffin is a very small university. So um, most of our licensing comes through consortium memberships, um, and it doesn't come directly through the university itself. So um, students that are off-site can't get print materials from other OhioLink institutions, which is our consortium, um, and they need to be told that up front so that they're not depending on some of those materials. And instead, we sort of have to guide their experience into the online area, into all of our, all of our digital licenses and away from the print collection. Um, but we work together to develop supplemental materials that appeal to both areas. And I think we do it rather well. Um, we have meetings once a month with the seated library where we talk about ideas. One of our latest ideas has been some type of like plagiarism intervention, plagiarism school, um, and the seated library has a plan moving forward for how that would benefit the seated students, and now we're working in the online area to see how we might be able to tweak that slightly so that it's a little more conducive to the online environment. The end result is the same. The path that we get there is different. Uh, there's a lot of training and outreach um, with, even with our seated faculty. Uh, it's amazing, I do travel to campus once a month and it's amazing sometimes the conversations that you get going at the lunch table. Um, but I also send out update emails to our instructors when something changes or when there's something neat happening, they get that information. Students get an email from me when they begin their, their adventure with us. And um, in that case, they have a person to contact. And it's amazing to me, once you become a person, um, then you really learn what it's like to direct traffic through your inbox because people know your name, they have your contact information, and in some cases, you're the only individual who's actually reached out to them personally and said, hey, we've got some great stuff that can help you through this. 
let me be your guide and show you what we have. And if you have questions, come back and see me. So I have directed traffic. It, students ask some of the most interesting questions. Um, how do I get to my FAFSA online? Well, I can't help you with that, but here's the person you can contact. So in some ways, I'm sort of that human directory because I am their connection to answers for various things, and it's not necessarily all library related. So that in a nutshell is what I do. Um, and I put my contact information on my last slide because I would love to hear from you for ideas, you know, questions, I'm open for all of it. So if there's anything that you would like to hear more about, please let me know. Thanks, Luann. We do have some questions, but I'm going to hold those um, until the end because I want to make sure that Seth uh, has a chance to talk to us about some of the things that he's discovered through uh, some recent research that he completed. So Luann, if you could pass uh, control over to Seth. And Seth, if you would please share with us what you've learned about the future of distance librarianship and how you think it might be changing and growing. Okay. All right. Um, let me pull up my slide here. All right. Uh, my name is Seth Allen. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? I'm going to take that as a yes. yes. Okay. Uh, I am the online instruction librarian at King University. Uh, this is a new position that was actually created over the summer, and I'm the first person to hold this position. We are a small liberal arts college that just within the past 10 years, um, we have uh, ventured out into online education, uh, into hybrid programs, into adult education. Um, so we've really moved at a breakneck speed towards uh, trying to develop non-traditional programs and the library, I think, has done a really good job of keeping up, but they finally decided last year with uh, 3,000 students now, and about two-thirds of those, uh, either in non-traditional programs or completely online, that it was time to hire an online instruction librarian. Um, I was just curious about who is the distance librarian? Um, is distance librarianship a distinct specialization? what is the future going to look like? Um, I gave a presentation uh, back in December at the North Carolina Library Association College and University Sections Conference, and I discussed some of the research that I did. I sent out a eight-question survey to uh, librarians who work with distance students. Uh, so they don't necessarily have to be distance librarians, they just have to uh, be some type of uh, academic librarian who worked with distant students. Uh, I asked them questions about uh, the size of their school, what they did, uh, and then I asked a couple questions about what they thought the future of distance librarianship was going to look like. The first slide that I have here, this is from some of the research that I did. Uh, there was a really good article um, in, in my lit review. I, I found a few articles about uh, the distance librarian, so not necessarily uh, the tools, but the actual the people who serve distance students. All right. Um, this is a chart, and it was taken from job ads in American Libraries, which is you know published by the American Library Association, between 1980 and 2010. And these are the number of announcements that were available, or the number of job openings for distance, online, off-campus librarians. All right. And I think it's very interesting that we see the number of announcements peaked around 1999 and 2002, all right, and then that number drops dramatically almost. All right, so um, I was doing research and I, I really used this um, as a template for some of the research that I did. I'm going to go to the next slide. Um, I sent out a survey. I got 50 responses from librarians. I sent out the survey to the Information Literacy Listserv, uh, Distance Librarian Listserv. Uh, I live in Tennessee. I sent it out to the uh, Tennessee Listserv as well. And I asked uh, librarians how their schools serve distance students. All right. And I, I broke it down basically into three different staffing models. All right, so at some schools, you have what's called a dispersed model. So in other words, you have several librarians who are serving 
uh, distant students, online students, uh, but there's not necessarily a leader. Okay? Uh, the smaller schools, it's a solo model, uh, and at some mid-sized schools as well, I found out, where it's just one librarian who's in charge of serving all distant students. All right, and another model is the dispersed with coordinator model. All right, so a situation where you have a, a team of librarians serving distant students, but you have one person who's coordinating um, all of the distance library services. All right, so in the research I found, um, I found that about half of the librarians said that their institutions had a dispersed model. About 20% were solo, and the rest, and I don't know why it's not showing up here, uh, they were dispersed with coordinators. Now, in other words, they had a team of librarians, but they had someone coordinating that. Okay. Um, I asked a couple of questions just to, to figure out why it was the way it was. Uh, I asked them what their FTE was, and you can see that it varies uh, greatly between different types of institutions. So librarians who responded their school had a distributed with coordinator model for serving distant students. On average, they had 9,000 FTE uh, for the solo distance librarian. Uh, on average, they had 1,300 FTE. And then the distributed model with no coordinator uh, was about uh, roughly equivalent to the one with the coordinator model, 9,880 FTE. So again, these are the average number of students for institutions by the different staffing models, all right? So one conclusion I came from that is uh, there isn't a one-size-fits-all staffing model for distance librarianship, okay? Obviously, it's going to depend on the staffing, it's going to depend on the number of students, and um, I, I'd like to be cautious about uh, trying to prescribe to people what, what the best staffing model is, okay? Um, I also asked them about some of the things that they did um, uh, most people, 82% of them, uh, did manage LibGuides. 60%, uh, I was really excited to see about that, was, uh, they served as an embedded librarian in an online course. Um, and if you'd like, uh, I'll share my email if you want to send me an email, I'll be glad to send you this entire PowerPoint. This is only about four or five slides from that PowerPoint. Um, one of the last questions that I asked was, what is the future of, what do you think the future of distance librarianship is? So um, to streamline the answers, uh, I gave them a couple of options, whether they thought that there was, that distance librarianship was just going to become mainstreamed into a general academic reference librarianship. Uh, I asked them if, if they thought that it was going to become a distinct specialization within academic libraries or if it was going to become a mix of those, okay? 36% uh, of the respondents thought in the future uh, that distance library services was just going to be integrated and um, it would just be just general reference public services in academic libraries. 28% says it depends and um, in their explanations, they said, well, you know, it, it depends on staffing, it depends on funding. 26% uh, said that it would be a mix of both. So in other words, it would be kind of like a specialization with very porous borders, all right? So there would be, you know, some people who are and then some people who uh, take on some uh, distance library services, all right? And then I just highlighted a couple of the response Responses that I got at the end of the survey, I asked, you know, what kind of questions or comments people had about the future of distance librarianship, and I, I highlighted a couple of those. Um, again, people said it depends on uh, the staffing that we have. Uh, some of them said uh, because of accreditation issues, they had to have a full-time distance service, service librarian. Uh, some of them said, I think larger institutions would likely have a specialist or a coordinator whereas the smaller schools probably not so much. Um, I saw this response a couple of times, and this is one that I thought just kind of embodied uh, what a lot of people are thinking right now. Uh, we, are, we work under the assumption that all students are mobile and that all librarians are to some extent distance librarians, okay? And I have a couple of other comments as well, okay? 
where people talked about uh, what worked on their campus, how they thought it should be. Um, so <laughs> at the end of this, uh, the only thing I can say is it depends. You know, it really depends on really the future of libraries. It depends on our staffing. It depends on funding. It really depends on the size of the campus as to uh, whether or not we can uh, have a separate distance librarian position. Uh, if you have any questions or if you'd like a copy of this entire presentation, uh, there's my email address here. So uh, please ask. Okay, thank you, Seth. Um, so I think what I'm what I'm getting uh, from the very end of your presentation is that just as the definitions of distance are kind of all over the place, so are the um, forecasts for what will happen with distance education as far as the library goes. So I think uh, I think we probably all are leaving with as many questions or maybe more questions, different questions than we started out with. Um, Obviously, this is a complex issue, and there are no clear-cut answers. We are going to, uh, as long as the panelists are able to stay for a few minutes, we're going to um, stick around. We have a few questions that came in that I would like to ask. Um, for those of you who cannot stay with us, there will be a recording of the session that will be sent out in the next couple of weeks to, um, to all attendees and registrants. And uh, if you do have to leave, please please take our survey. I'm posting that in the chat right now. Uh, in order for us to continue bringing these kinds of presentations to you, we need to know what you think of them and uh, whether you think they're worthwhile. So please take the survey. So at this point, I want to go back to, um, to Seth, your presentation. And I, I just want to ask a question that came in from Erica Bennett, who says, what would an all online university with a classic director staff instruction team, reference team, access services team be classified as, as you were, you broke down the, uh, the different types into classifications, how would you classify that, that model? I would say that would be a dispersed with coordinator model. Because you have a team of people, uh, but you do have a director who's coordinating the entire thing. Okay, great, great. Um, the next question I have then is, for um, for let's see. Well, I have a general question for the panelists. Earlier in the presentation, Pat Hamilton asked, "What strategies work to engage distance students in groups as opposed to one-on-one? -on -one? How useful is recording sessions?" And I think that's something that um, Priscilla, that you really talked about quite a bit. And then, how do you know how well it works? So I guess that's a um, multi-tiered question. So this is Neely. Um, I, I have found that that challenge um, can be said uh, of our uh, regular on-campus students as well. <laughs> um, how do you in engage um, groups of students? And one of the best ways I've found is to really work with the faculty to ensure that they are um, aware of our services and that we become embedded in those situations. So for example, in one class, which is a managerial finance course, um, I work with a faculty member um, on a particular assignment, and he holds a study session once a week in the evening, and um, he has allowed me to host it, and he stays through the entire session, and we basically go through resources um, that will help them prepare for their assignment, um, and the teams then break out, and they go do their thing, and they come back again. So I've engaged them um, via video conference as well as via group emails, um, which seems to have worked well um, in those situations. But I think it, it is tricky um, trying to engage people when uh, you don't always have that one-on-one -on -one contact. I think librarian instruction is always tricky. I, I don't think many students just don't find our content to be that fascinating many times until so they're really desperate for it. We found at um, APUS that often our completely remote students are so desperate for a human voice and, and to feel that someone's actually sitting down holding their hand 
that when you can get them into a screen tag situation, they are actually wrapped. It's, it's actually kind of fun. <laughs> They'll listen to anything you have to tell them and take any advice you give them. So um, that is maybe one benefit to having students who are sort of desperate for human contact. They will listen to you quite a bit more. But we also found it was really important, and we use Adobe Connect. That was all we had available for these kinds of sessions. It, it's really crucial to have more than one librarian with you when you do things like this so that one person can monitor the chat while the other person is sharing their screen and trying to kind of drive the presentation. Yeah. Uh, this is Seth. I'd like to confirm what Priscilla just said or affirm what she just said. Uh, I, I ran into that situation. This is the first semester that I've done online workshops for um, distance students. Like I said, we have about two-thirds of our students are online. Um, I sent out a request to all the students who were in our uh, GPS Graduate and Professional Studies program. I invited them to take part in one of three workshops on different nights. I got close to 90 responses. Okay, and The third time I felt a little overconfident in my ability to manage the software. So I had about four or five people who weren't able to log on. And it really helps to have the backup person and just to announce you know, you're, you're there to facilitate the workshop. If you have any tech questions, uh, have a backup person and explain this person is going to be here. If you have any questions, please direct them to this person. So. Well, and I think this is Luann, just to, just to piggyback off of what Neely said earlier, your faculty really are your advocates in a lot of ways for providing services to your distance learners. and. Um, we've just recently started to implement webinars at the start of each term for faculty. Just a meet and greet with the librarian. We'll walk you through things and here are some neat things that you can do in your classes with our resources. But then also, um, you know, here's our contact information. Here's stuff you can send to your students. Um, and it's a little bit discouraging when you're in a synchronous session because two or three people, maybe five if you're lucky, will come into the synchronous session. But I can always gauge the success of that session based on the number of email follow-ups that I receive after the link goes out. When our, when our um, faculty trainer sends the link out to our faculty, my inbox blows up. So, um, you know, I think that just because there isn't a physical presence in some of the synchronous sessions doesn't necessarily mean that you can measure the success of the session off of that. Hey, this is Stephanie, um, and I, I wanted to say that one of the things that I think is very valuable, though, is recording those things as much as possible because I do this for, I do, uh, like, webinars on demand for classes. Um, I've, I've also done them just as open webinars. Anybody can come. But the, and I track how many people get into my recorded versions of that, and that number has increased fairly steadily, whereas the number of physical attendees has gone down somewhat. So I think it's really valuable to have those recordings available. People often ask for those. Um, it's not always well comfortable, but um, it's a really, I think it's a really good service to offer. Okay, great. Um, I think we heard from all of you on that. That's great. I would ask um, if, you're, if you are a participant rather than a panelist, and if you would like to respond to someone in the chat who has a question, please feel free to do that. I'd also like to ask participants to please, in chat, uh, respond to the question if you can. Any free apps for remote login to see a student's screen? So if you have an answer to that question, feel free to, um, to enter that in the chat box. Um, our next question, I want to go back a uh, little ways to Luann's presentation. And Luann, Kim Mullins asked, what resources are you using or referencing to provide copyright support for distance learning? Can you talk about that briefly? Sure. So um, part of the, the copyright aspect of my work involved collaborating with our seated library in order to um, move uh, copyright policy through various faculty committees. So we started um, collaborating a lot with some of the seated faculty as well and talking about various ways that they should be addressing copyright in their courses. Um, so with that policy in hand, we also created a procedural document. And um, in some ways, it's a little sneaky because um, we don't have the personnel to manage a really large 
um, copyright workflow where we're constantly tracking permissions and renewing permissions. Um, so our policy guides our instructional designers as well as our subject matter experts to find um, resources through the library or, um, or use links to websites and to sort of read the fine print on the website to make sure that it can be linked. Um, and that's really the way that we sort of roll some of the copyright education into the process um, because those conversations happen um, at various intervals and it's not exactly a, a structured type of environment um, for those conversations. But um, then we also hold trainings um, that is discussed in the, the Meet a Librarian um, session at the beginning of each term. Um, so we're having various conversations about copyright in pockets of the institution. And I would imagine that eventually a lot of that content will end up on a LibGuide or something that we can actually put in as an informational piece as well. Okay, thank you. Um, another question from Jennifer Walls. How do you get students who are uh, afraid? You know, when you think about students in the library, they're afraid to come up and ask questions of a librarian. What do you do with students who are fearful about asking for help when they're not even here in the library? And that, that's a question for any of the panelists to answer. That's an excellent question, Ms. Priscilla, and it's a huge challenge, and it's one of those reasons that you really do have to be proactive and, and rely on the faculty, because students are automatically, I think, more comfortable with their instructors, they, they see them more, and they hear from them more. So if their instructor says, oh, look, you have your own librarian, or at least here is this librarian email address that you can contact, please, they're very friendly, they'll believe it coming from them. Other than that, being as visible as you can in the classroom or um, on the campus, making your website easy to use can be a big help. And when you do have them as captive, <laughs> when you have that opportunity, you can just exude friendliness and really make them feel that you are happy to help. Um, I think that makes that attitude makes a big difference. Hi, this is Neil. I just wanted to uh, support what Priscilla was saying. Uh, absolutely. Any opportunities you have to talk with somebody on the phone, um, you know, extend uh, kindness via email, any type of contact really makes a difference in having people feel comfortable with approaching you. Um, I also feel like putting a face to a name is helpful. So we've recently started putting uh, our pictures on LibGuides. Um, so even though I'm uncomfortable sometimes having that picture there, it's helpful because it makes you more human and I think therefore more approachable. I agree. I think even the way that we interact with our distance learners via email, I think it has a big impact on the relationship that you build with them. I know in my case, I'm not a big fan of, of starched emails, you know, dear student, sincerely me. Um, I like, hi there. Now, I hope all is going well for you this term. Um, your instructor contacted me and asked that I reach out to you because you might be having an issue with finding scholarly sources in the library. So here are some tutorials that we've built and here are some links and if you have any questions at all, please reach out because I'm here to help you. I mean, I've been contacted by several faculty members um, just recently as my work with them increases to do things like that. And I think just being personal kind of, you know, folksy is not the right term, but um, a little less starch, you know, they realize that we are a real person on the other end of the computer, and I think they're appreciative of that. They are. Louie, and I would, I would completely agree. This is Priscilla again. I remember when I first started um, working at an all-online university, I was very much opposed to using emoticons, smileys, and winkies in my emails. I just, I just really didn't like it. It wasn't probably six months before I was using them in every single message, just because I, I didn't have the ability to smile, physically smile at a student who approached me for help, so I had to smile via text. And it was it was hard for me to overcome that. <laughs> but now, I mean, smileys, I can't imagine sending an email to a student without one, just to let them know that I am friendly. Okay, great. Um, Stephanie. 
we had a question earlier from Sandy asking if you could tell us a little bit more about your research project in, in which you were um, interviewing students. Could you talk about that? Sure. Well, I'm kind of hoping to submit a proposal to the distance learning conference, so I'll give you a little preview. Um, I did a 10-week study with uh, nine uh, eCampus students. Um, it was a photo elicitation study, so an ethnographic study, which is, uh, I think, Neely mentioned earlier. Um, I had them take photos and screenshots of certain activities they were doing to document their research methodologies, motivations, um, barriers, um, basically the idea being to get a, a, a insight into the secret life of the off-campus student. And um, it was really, really fascinating. It, it was a lot of work, and I'm still um, analyzing. I've got about 30 hours of interviews that I'm coding right now. Um, and I think it has given me a great deal of insight into how the barriers and the challenges that our distance learners face that we sometimes forget about because we have such great internet access on campus and you know we don't always think about that. And that's kind of where my point was coming from in my presentation that online does not equal distance, um, that there are issues, and I think other people have mentioned that, that, that really are unique and, and specific challenges for our, our truly distance learners that we need to pay attention to. And like I said, I'm hoping to at least write this paper up, so, um, but I'm happy to share my thoughts with anybody else who's interested. Thanks for asking, Sandy. Great. Thank you so much, Stephanie. I think we'll probably all look forward to, uh, to seeing that. Now, I think we have one, uh, one more question that we have time for. Um, Seth, is the, someone asked earlier, Robin Ashford, the change in title, this is an example from, from Robin's institution. Uh, they recently changed from distance services librarian to e-learning librarian. Do you see that as maybe a sign of the changes, the trends that are occurring in distance librarianship? Yeah, I'm actually glad you asked, and I wish I'd mentioned it earlier. Um, uh, there is, it was really strategic that I'm called the online instruction librarian because my boss conceived it as a way to meet the needs of, of the online needs of our students, so not necessarily the needs of our online students, if that makes sense to you guys. Um, we know that a lot of our students, especially the digital natives, they may live on campus, uh, they may not actually step foot in the library. So my goal is to be able to reach those students and also the students who are, say, 200 miles away and they take only online classes. And I, I think it's really a sign of the times. And, um, you know, I've seen studies where people try to categorize the different types of students. And, you know, I think this presentation, uh, this, this whole discussion shows just how problematic it is. But I also think that just as soon as we categorize our students and try to um, ascertain what needs each group has, those categories are imploding. Um, and a good example of that is while we've had uh, distance programs for about you know, three or four years now, uh, just within the past year have we created a Blackboard shell for every face-to-face -face course. So even face-to-face -face courses that are supposedly 100% face-to-face, now they have a Blackboard shell, now they're able to share documents. So um, all classes are really becoming hybrid. You know, our, our categories, uh, no matter how we try to think about them, they're going to collapse in a, a few years, I think, anyway. And the rules are just going to be rewritten. So. Okay, great. Um, just a few final comments that I'd like to share. I want to thank the panel members, Luann, Priscilla, Seth, Stephanie, and Neely, for giving us your time today and for sharing your knowledge and experience with us. I'd also like to thank all of the participants who joined us. Thank you for submitting some great questions. I think obviously we could have used more time to discuss this topic. Uh, it is a hugely broad topic and as we've seen, um, there are a lot more questions than answers. We would definitely like to continue providing this kind of programming uh, 
um, if people think it's worth worthwhile for us to do so. And in order for us to determine that, again, it's really important for us to hear from you. So I'm going to go ahead and um, and let's see. I'm going to post my survey again. If you before you leave the room, if you could click on that link. Um, it's really, you know, really important for us to hear your thoughts about today's session and about future future sessions that you would like to see. Um, the surveys are anonymous and confidential unless you choose to reveal your identity. Today's session was recorded and registrants will be receiving a link to the recorded session along with a link to the feedback survey. So if you didn't get a chance to uh, fill out the survey today, we'll make sure that you have the opportunity to do that later. And that's going to happen, I would say, within the next two weeks. So just be patient. We'll get that recording out to you. Again, thank you for joining us for the session today. We hope to see you at our other upcoming distance learning section discussion group programs. And if you're looking for how to find that information out, just keep an eye on the, the DLS blog where, um, where we regularly post updates to anything that we're planning. I believe we will have a session coming at the end of April, so keep an eye out for that. And then, of course, we'll have a discussion at, um, at ALA Annual in San Francisco this year. So thanks, everyone, and uh, we hope to see you again soon. Thanks, Jill. Thank you, Jill. Thank, Thank you. you.